Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the Westermarks for giving me this great honor today to share with you some recent work and thoughts on AL amyloidosis. As we look at the survival curves uh, of the past uh, 35 years or so, we see that there have been improvements. Improvements in all likelihood due to Meldex and stem cell transplant and more recently due to bortezomib. These are very important improvements for patients. We also know that complete hematologic responses, as many speakers have uh, demonstrated, translate into organ improvement because of resorption of uh, amyloid as a result of uh, turning off the factory, stopping the production of the clonal protein. But it's not a trip to the beach. Patients who live longer have bookends of medical ordeals, such as this patient did who was diagnosed in 2002, had transplant on a protocol consolidation, relapsed in 2008, had a difficult year, and died. It may be the case that this patient didn't do as well as many did in this cohort from Sloan Kettering uh, because this patient didn't receive bortezomib index co consolidation, the median survival for the whole cohort who underwent risk-adapted melphalan-based stem cell transplant, and many of them uh, who underwent consolidation had a median survival of 10 and a half years, or 10.4 years. This cohort also demonstrates the importance of complete response with uh, overall about a 75% 12-year survival in complete responders. So what I'm going to talk about today is the next 10 years and the way that we may be able to improve the survival curve with the aspirational goal of getting up here. 10 years, 75 or 80% survival in AL patients. I know it sounds challenging, but I think the tools are available for us to do that. And yes, plasma cell burden matters. In the memorial cohort, clearly there was a break between those who had less than 10% and those who had more than 10%. Uh, and clearly, as other investigators have pointed out, and as I suggested some years ago, uh, this is a very important feature of the disease. So going into the plasma cell, I'm going to talk about a number of aspects of plasma cell biology that I think are very relevant to AL. They're listed here. And I want to highlight the data I'm going to present on the BCL2 family profile. But I want to start by telling you that the cells that we work with from patient bone marrows are clonal cells. We do CD138 selection, as many of you do. We often sort cells in order to get a highly purified population. Our cytogeneticists uh, do CD138 selection to do fish. Our cells in the laboratory can be used for multiple purposes, including transcriptional profiles. We verify their clonality based on a series of 16 cases in which we did transcriptional profiles. This is the expression level of the clonal constant region of the light chain in these cases. These are the expression levels of the non-clonal light chains. A big significance uh, relative expression based on log base 2 in the Affymetrix uh, transcriptional profile that we used at the time. Many years ago, we did this with whole mononuclear cell preps from bone marrow. And uh, at BU, the late David Selden continued this work and produced a database of AL light chain variable region gene utilization and myeloma light chain gene utilization. And in this database, it was clear that there were seven light chain variable region germline donors that accounted for 70% of cases. The variable region light chain gene use in systemic AL is restricted. And there were several that were associated with rather elevated hazard ratios. So what do we do with this knowledge? Well, early on, we were interested in organ tropism, a topic I'm not going to discuss today. We use this knowledge now to guide certain projects. 
We have a minimal residual disease trial that is accruing. We've successfully identified the germline donors in uh, eight of nine patients. And as you would expect, the identification has followed what AL base tells us are the variable region light chain genes that are usually used. At one, two, and three years, we will use European MRD standards to do real-time PCR. We have a collaborator who will take the variable region light chain gene sequence and do plasma proteomics from marrow plasma, and we're still struggling to put together a next generation sequencing plan. We have baseline peripheral blood mononuclear cells, as well as the marrow preps from years one, two, and three. And we'll see if any of these techniques in any way correlate with relapse. We're also investigating in patients with lambda smoldering myeloma who meet certain criteria, whether or not we can identify a lambda gene that is associated with AL. We hope to accrue 200 patients. We're getting samples. It's a very challenging project, and we hope to complete it over the next five years. In addition, rather than doing constant region knockdown, cap and lambda constant region knockdown, which we've demonstrated can be done, we are focusing on germline gene knockdown of the lambda-6 and lambda-2 genes. We have cell lines that express these genes. And this is an example of the uh, 180 nanometer uh, in diameter nanoparticle that our bioengineering colleagues produced for us, one that we vetted extensively. And this is an example of what we can do with germline knockdown. This is an siRNA targeted to a single sequence that occurs in all lambda-6 light chains. What you see here is scrambled control, light chain constant region knockdown, and our single siRNA. This is uh, the kind of iterative uh, experimentation that must be done. These are ratios of our nanoparticle to uh, siRNA weight to weight. At a certain concentration of siRNA, the particle doesn't work. But as we taper the concentration of siRNA down to 12 to 1, we get over 90% reduction in message. But more important than germline gene utilization is fish. Fluorescent in situ hybridization, it's a way to paint chromosomes to identify abnormalities in chromosomes. In a series of over 400 patients from Mayo Clinic with CIG fish in which the cytoplasm is painted to identify the isotypic cells, uh, and uh, a series of 101 cases from Heidelberg in which CD138 selection at a high purity is used. What we see is a pattern of uh, relative frequency of the 1114 translocation, relative frequency of monosomy or deletion uh, 13P. We do see gain 1Q with some frequency and rarely a high risk feature such as deletion 17P. I'm going to argue that these are very important data, ones that we should use as we treat patients, have a better understanding of a patient's uh, situation. Uh, deletion 17P is interesting. Uh, Dr. Wong has a poster describing uh, a series of uh, cases. I do think it's much less important in AL than it is in myeloma because the mutation rate in AL is much lower than it is in myeloma. In myeloma, 10% of newly diagnosed patients have deletion 17P, so they lose one a P53 gene. They also have mutations on the other allele. So half of them have no P53, and those are the cases that uh, develop drug resistance, shorten remission durations, and shorten survival. At relapse, the situation is even worse. We don't have that case uh, in AL. What Dr. Sholin and his colleagues have done is uh, quite controversial. They've suggested that the cytogenetic abnormalities affect outcome with specific types of therapy, with bortezomib in the case, uh, excuse me, with Meldex in the case of uh, GAIN1Q, and with uh, bortezomib in the case of patients with the 1114. These are very provocative data, but ones that I think we need to pay attention to. Uh, at Mayo, in their series, they took all cases with less than 10% plasma cells and showed that the presence of the 1114 was a negative prognostic factor. We did a similar analysis using real-time PCR, similar survival curves, and 
when we divided the cases up into quartiles, we got shorter uh, overall survival median durations uh, with increasing amounts of uh, cyclin D1 expression in each case. When we looked at our transcriptional profiles, we did find a number that overexpressed cyclin D1. So these are 1114 cases. Similar data was generated over 10 years ago by uh, Roshini Abraham and uh, Rafael Fonseca. This is important. And it's important because the 1114, which is a very common translocation in cancer, even though we don't have full characterization of the breakpoints, the 1114 in plasma cells occurs during a, a switch recombination, class switch recombination. Uh, and in other cancers, it occurs for a variety of reasons, many of which are, are not clearly understood. But there's an emerging literature on BCL2 family members relevant to the 1114 and particularly relevant to the use of the BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax, which has been approved for use in CLL. So a little bit of background on BCL2. There are, uh, I'm simplifying for the, for the sake of uh, clarity. Uh, the anti-apoptotic proteins, BCL2, BCLXL, MCL1, sequester the activator proteins, most notably BIM, although the others are sequestered as well. So the proapoptotic activators, when they're released from the anti-apoptotic proteins, interact with the effector proteins on the surface of mitochondria. Those effector proteins change their shape, they homodimerize, heterodimerize, and enable the mitochondrial membrane to become permeabilized, releasing cytochrome C, triggering the caspase cascade, and intrinsic apoptosis. Over the past uh, decade or so, BH3 mimetics have been developed that are specific for several or individual ones of these anti-apoptotic proteins with the exception of MCL1, which is an unstable protein. In addition, Anthony Latia Dana-Farber has shown that small molecules introduced into cancer cells that have dependence on one anti-apoptotic protein or another can trigger apoptosis because the cells are primed to apoptose. So venetoclax, or ABT199, has been used in myeloma and has been used in vitro and in vivo and has shown incredibly uh, sens sensitive activity in the 1114 cases, both in vitro and in vivo. And that represents a small fraction of myeloma cases, only 20%. So the co company has been resistant to the concept of uh, moving forward with uh, venetoclax in a select subset of myeloma patients, looking for ways to modify uh, BCL2 family member expression. So what we did was we looked at our transcriptional library. These are the cyclin D1 high cases with 1114. And we noticed that BCLXL had significantly lower expression. And this has been demonstrated in myeloma cell lines and some few patient samples with the 1114. We noticed that BAX was also overexpressed, but this is gene expression data, not protein data. So what we did was we purified plasma cells from AL patients, and we exposed them to a concentration of ABT that uh, triggered significant apoptosis in our positive control and no apoptosis in our negative control. And what we get is uh, caspase 3 activity after 18 hours, significantly more activity in uh, clones with the 1114 plus minus gain 1Q, limited activity in clones with the 1114 with deletion 13Q, and limited activity in the others. The FISH findings are done in the cytopathology lab routinely. We had nothing to do with them. We actually didn't analyze this data until we had to put the poster together. But it's compelling data. When we look at our negative control, the H929 myeloma cell line, our positive control, the KMS12 myeloma cell line, and we look at two other cell lines that don't respond at all to ABT, uh, what we see, overexpression of cyclin D1, minimal expression of MCL1, minimal expression of BCLXL, a lot of BCL2 and a lot of BIM. So it's no surprise that the BCL2 inhibitor works in this cell line. Uh, in the negative control, that's down here, these are the positive controls, uh, what we see is a, a lot of MCL1, some BCL2, some BCLXL, 
but no BIM essentially. And about 20% of mantle cell lymphomas that uh, also have the 1114 translocation have no BIM. So BCL2 inhibition doesn't work in them. The picture is one of uh, variable phenotypes with respect to BCL2 family members, an important concept. In this negative cell line, we see a ton of BCLXL. In the U266 cell line that has the 1114, we see a ton of BCLXL. So what the availability of these other anti-apoptotic proteins means is that you, if you give an agent which displaces BIM from one anti-apoptotic protein, there's plenty of the others to sop it up before it gets to the mitochondrial membrane to interact with the effector proteins. But there is another system in clonal plasma cells. Um, and even though the company has agreed for us to do a phase one trial with ABT199 and relapsed AL, a trial I think will be very important, we have to keep in mind that the other pillar of AL clonal plasma cell fitness is the ubiquitin protein system. Uh, and when the Nobel Prize was delivered, the press release said proteins labeled for destruction. Uh, I needn't go into this. We're all familiar with the importance of uh, the UPS in myeloma because of bortezomib. And where would we be today without bortezomib? Our patients respond much better to it uh, than they do to uh, conventional, prior conventional therapies. It's useful in many patients at multiple stages of the disease. And the important thing about bortezomib is that it's bortezomib acts as the beta prime uh, moiety. In the, in the ring. Although it has some activity at beta 1, its primary site of activi activity is the beta 5 chymotryptic site. When you look at myeloma cell lines, and here are some of our friends, MM1S, KMS12, for example, what you see is, again, phenotypic variability with respect to activity of those uh, sites within the ring. So you see variable beta 5 activity, Beta, beta 1 and beta 2. As you can see, the KMS12 line, which is res, uh, sensitive to uh, ABT, has more beta 5 activity than the MM1S cell line, which is resistant to ABT. So we're dealing with two areas of phenotypic variability that provide survival propensities uh, for uh, AL plasma cells and myeloma cells. And when you correlate a, a beta 5 uh, baseline activity with sensitivity to bortezomib based on the caspase assay. What you see is the MM1S uh, cell line that has very low proteasome capacity is sensitive to bortezomib. KMS12 is less so. And the uh, cell line that has uh, the most proteasome capacity is the least sensitive to bortezomib. So you see a range of responses uh, to bortezomib in these experiments as you see to ABT199 in the experiments I described earlier. The same applies to beta-1 activity, highly correlated. When you look at patient cells, what you see is phenotypic variability, again, particularly for the beta-5 in patients CD138 selected cells. So we have two systems. We have the ubiquitin proteasome system. We have the BH3 system, uh, the BCL2 system. And I think they're both pillars of uh, fitness for our clones, the clones that we deal with every day in patients. Important points are the genetic instability in AL is lower than it is in myeloma, meaning there are probably fewer subclones. And mutations do confer a degree of uh, fitness versus chemogenic stress. Second, both the ubiquitin protein system and the unfolded protein response, which are linked, uh, tell us a lot about our clones. You've seen data on light chain constant region knockdown. And uh, I think that the data is compelling uh, in the sense that I think plasma cells are quite competent to secrete light chains. But if there are unpaired heavy chains in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, they become uh, quite uh, stuffed 
uh, and uh, an, an unfolded protein response of a terminal nature can be triggered via intrinsic apoptosis. We believe this is NOx and MCL1 mediated uh, because uh, uh, the unfolded protein response results in upregulation of NOxA. And when we knocked down both the constant region and NOxA in a publication several years ago, we were able to show that the amount of uh, intrinsic apoptosis was significantly reduced. Uh, this is very similar to proteasome inhibitor responses in, in clonal plasma cells. So what I think is happening in AL plasma cells is that they may be more sensitive to bortezomib, but it's probably because there's less BCLXL dependence uh, in the uh, overrepresented 1114 clones in AL plasma cells. They're more BCL2, BCL2, MCL1 codependent. Uh, and therefore, they have less capacity of anti-apoptotic proteins to sop up BIM and uh, to prevent apoptosis from triggering. It doesn't mean that myeloma cells are not sensitive to uh, bortezomib. They are, but they're a little less sensitive than AL clones. So let's move out of the plasma cell, beyond the clonal plasma cell. I'm going to talk about monoclonal antibody therapies uh, and some aspects of their use, survivorship, and then the future. Daratumumab. Daratumumab is the next big thing. It's going to be bigger, I believe, than venetoclax for AL. It's going to change the game. It's an, a monoclonal antibody approved for myeloma in December of last year. There are several posters here uh, regarding its use in AL patients as a single agent. It has single agent activity, clearly, from the posters. And uh, I think that it's important to realize that it probably acts by many different methods, mechanisms, ADCC being a prominent one, but there also may be a role for complement-dependent cytotoxicity. And what I'll share with you today is evidence that AL patients' sera function quite well in a cytotoxicity assay with daratumumab, uh, causing uh, significant lysis uh, based on a standard method. So I suspect there's a basis for responsiveness to daratumumab uh, in AL, not only the fact that all AL plasma cells express CD38, but that the mechanisms are in, relatively intact in AL patients, at least with respect to CDC and probably ADCC. But more importantly it, uh, are these data that uh, Thanos Demopoulos presented in Copenhagen last month. This is a clinical trial in myeloma called the Pollux trial. Patients were randomized. Patients had to have one to three prior lines of therapy. So these are relapsed patients, uh, randomized to receive Revlimid index or daratumumab Revdex. And look at the split. Look at the split. Uh, a difference of 26% progression. You can imagine what's going to happen when this agent is brought up front, particularly in AL patients. We're going to be able to see a markedly higher level of complete responses. There, were, there was a, about a 25% rate of MRD, minimal residual disease negative CRs, uh, in uh, the patients in this cohort. So it was profoundly effective. Uh, Dr. Jacquard and his colleagues will be starting a phase two trial in France uh, with daratumumab in AL patients who've not achieved VGPR. So if you've had a PR or a stable disease, uh, you may be lucky enough to be one of the 40 patients to enroll on, on their study. Very important trial. But I've lived through an era of novel agents and I'm convinced that a three-word abbreviation is better than a two-word uh, phrase. Uh, so from novel agents, we go to disease-modifying agents or monoclonals. Um, and we have numerous ones. Dr. Pepys has described to us activity of the anti-SAP uh, approach. Dr. Gertz will share with us the data on NEOD001. I do want to pay, uh, pay particular attention to this phase 2B trial, the PRONTO trial, for previously treated AL patients with persistent cardiac damage. It's a very important trial, and it's very important for patients to realize there'll be an open label extension. You randomize to get one or the other for 12 months, and then at the end of 12 months, if you need it, you're going to be able to get the supposedly active agent. That should mollify patients who are concerned about being randomized on a phase uh, two or three trial. But what 
interests me the most is the variability in organ responses with these therapies. You can point to a lot of factors that might indeed play a role in why some patients respond and others don't. Certainly amyloid burden is probably important. The genetic and cellular differences in macrophage biology probably are going to turn out to be quite important and need to be studied. And as we know, there are differences in density of, of fibrillar infiltrates. These are both renal biopsies. And differences in patterns. These are spicules uh, and these are uh, clusters. Uh, and therefore, might the differences in the uh, uh, deposition pattern and distribution of the fibrils play a role in resorption uh, with an active agent. So uh, as these trials evolve, I do think correlative endpoints that explore response variability are absolutely necessary to help us understand the difference between responders and non-responders. They may include things like blinded pathologic review and scoring of baseline renal biopsies for amount of scarring, amyloid, and pattern of distribution. They may include transcriptional profiles of baseline or post-exposure peripheral blood mononuclear cells asking whether a baseline expression signature or changes in gene expression somehow correlate with response. And importantly, I think we open the door for the use of adjuvants for macrophage activity, adjuvants perhaps as GMCSF, and, and in the pharmaceutical industry, the opportunity for those who have assays that can measure amyloid digestion by macrophages, the opportunity to use high throughput screens with bacterial products uh, that may stimulate mac uh, macrophage activity and, and increased uh, digestion by some measure should be doable. Uh, but the challenges and the unknowns are formidable for us as investigators and for pharmaceutical companies. We don't know, for example, is fast resorption better than slow resorption? We do believe that scarring occurs. I do believe there's a difference between healing and scarring, and I do think that scarring can occur. We're uh, straddled with metrics such as the six-minute walk as we design trials, but we have to work through that. And the theoretical risks concern me because we're essentially in the pit with innate immunity. And what that means is that there may be a risk of rapid recurrence of amyloid at relapse in those areas that have been cleansed. There may be a risk of second malaise, the risk of lupus, for example. And if someone goes into one of these therapies with a brewing infection or uh, an occult cancer with macrophage activation at baseline, might we trigger a hemophagocytic syndrome? I, I honestly don't know, but it's something that uh, I keep in mind. Most importantly for patients are issues of survivorship. And we don't do a great job with patients with persistent organ disease because, you know, a, a viral infection like influenza can cause the tripling of proteinuria. Uh, medications can sometimes cause progression of uh, organ damage. We need a better approach to, t to counseling these patients if we want to achieve that higher level of overall survival. And does healing or scarring occur, as I mentioned? I do think there is a degree of scarring in all cases with long-term survivors. And it's something that we should pay more attention to and try to understand better. And obviously, for patients, the impacts in the sphere of their lives, family uh, burdens, financial burdens, emotional hardship. But above all is the sort of Damocles relapse. Now, this is a survival curve from the Cantu 007 trial. All these patients got bortezomib and were bortezomib naive at relapse. And what you see is five-year median survival. But now that everyone gets bortezomib up front, uh, those numbers are going to change, obviously. Uh, but we have to do a better job with relapse. Fortunately, Dr. Landau, Dr. Dispensieri are all over this problem and brainstorming it and will hopefully come up with an approach that will provide some guidance over the next couple of years. But the challenge for me is always when to retreat and when to retreat. Because some patients, once the organ damage is advanced enough, are not going to be, be helped by, uh, by chemotherapy. Uh, so the horizons are bright. There's an opportunity to increase uh, survival, I think, over the next 10 years based on all of these uh, forces which are poised to help the effort, particularly the emerging collaboration among stakeholders. But uh, the bright horizons may result in something like this, some uh, hallucinated scheme of total therapy uh, that's both uh, anti-amyloid, uh, as I hallucinate this, um, anti-amyloid and uh, uh, anti-plasma cell, perhaps a measure of MRD, 
uh, allowing us to consolidate. None of these therapies should take a long time. I don't believe in continuous therapy in this disease uh, at this point. Uh, those who are MOD positive may go on to some additional form of consolidation, and others will receive novel therapies. We'll hear about CAR T cell therapy in this session. And finally, we are, um, how shall I put it? We are uh, confronting the shades of unmet needs. Earlier diagnosis is critical. We have to come up with a better way to assess risk of relapse. Perhaps MRD studies will help, perhaps they won't. We desperately need to combine the two monoclonals in a relapse refractory setting, in a pilot study to determine uh, safety. M my personal opinion, having used them both, is that they'll be very safe. You just have to construct a treatment schedule uh, because uh, ultimately those two agents, uh, whether it's NEOD or another agent, will have to be brought up front. And finally, continued collaboration among investigators, pharma regulators, all the stakeholders, uh, as we conduct trials, as Dr. Merlini said on Sunday, with biomarker endpoints and informative correlative studies. And I'd like to thank all those who have supported this work, particularly the lab folks and the funders. Thank you.